Well, as the pendulum swings, right? You know the whole allegory about the pendulum? Is that uh, we swing to one extreme and swing to the other. The perfect will of God's in the middle. We, we get extreme. And uh, so, we're trying to strike this balance in wisdom. You know, for, for, for instance, many people have been offended at uh, men of God, Brother Stair and others, and then, so then they swing to the extreme opposite side and say, I will never trust any man. No one's going to tell me what to do. Well, that's clearly a swing overboard to the left. And of course, then you could say, well, yes, we have to honor man of God. And then you end up worshiping men of God and emulating them and making idols out of them. And that, that's no good either, is it? There's some something in the middle here. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I always feel compelled to throw things back and forth uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm changing my tune. But you know, we I've seen uh, in the last month or two I've seen some people who had been very hardened against things of God and very reluctant to hear the Word of God change and God's softening their hearts and um, afflictions and other things are making people awake and aware to the necessity of fellowship. And Okay, so never does the Bible say there isn't a man of God. I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about son of man and that there's no singular man that carries that title. But that doesn't mean that there isn't men of God that God might magnify to a degree, right? And that uh, to smaller groups of people, if you will, or what have you. Now that you believe whom him, him whom God hath sent, whoever God sends to you. Or, and that's, that's an exercise you as an individual have to find out. It's not like we're, we're without hierarchy or without authority. Uh, the Old Testament, even though we're not under the law of Moses, the, law, the Old Testament often describes righteous principles and standards that are also part of the New Testament. For example, the, the women are commanded to be silent in the churches, as also saith the law. So sometimes you can reference the Old Testament for, you know, righteous conduct or for certain things. And uh, so, so it's the same thing. Moses said, let the God, the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So we're not, I, I, every once in a while I do, I feel compelled to point out that we're not doing away with men of God. We're just, there's a balance in it all. But God is going to help us find the balance. And uh, it is what it is. The church is very much backslidden. Some people are apostatized. Some aren't. And, uh, but God is going to gather His people. He's going to gather the elect. Those who have been scattered and bruised and um, offended. And through uh, the shepherds who fed themselves and did not feed the flock, who scattered them, who drove them away, what what have you. Uh, Ezekiel 34 says that uh, God says, I, even I, will both search and seek out my sheep. And I will bring them to a fold and I will set, you know, I'll, I'll give them one shepherd, even David, which is a similitude of, you know, ministers and stuff, and they shall feed my people and so on and so forth. There will be a restoration to those things. So it's a it's a pendulum. It's a it's a balance of things. It's honor, but not worship and emulation. And uh, it's like I said, the way God's going to deal with some of this stuff is He's just going to ramp up the affliction until your own sense, your own sense of needing fellowship and strength from others, is going to be that 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 sense of necessity and urgency is going to grow in you and it's going to overcome your fear of being offended at the, which is motivating you to separate yourself but never a separation never a separation a principle of Jesus Christ or the or the church right these be they who separate themselves sensual having not the spirit or having not the spirit influence them into the true will of God the true will of God will always draw you Together, it'll always draw. I'm going to start with something. This is just, uh, I have two kind of unrelated things here. The first one, this shouldn't take me too long. But I was just reviewing it and I thought, well, that's pretty interesting and still relevant. Uh, 
Beware lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives you and then you become hardened. When you become hardened, you protect yourself, you put up a wall, you close yourself off. But then, of course, uh, you do that under the uh, subtlety and deception of sin, thinking you're protecting yourself by separating whatever it is you're protecting. And then, of course, what happens is you pine away. You pine away. You're like the vine that's separated from the vine and you'll wither as a branch and it's not apparent right away. You can pick a rose and put it in a vase with some water in it and the rose will look nice for quite some time, but the rose has already begun to start start dying and dwindling because you plucked it off. <laughs> you know, you pluck the... You pluck, you get plucked out of the vine. Uh, you might have a little green left in you. You might have a little flow, flow of life source, the momentum of a flow of life source in you as a branch, even though you're separated. And, and but you are going to wither. And you could try to circumvent that or to reduce the effects of that by putting that broken branch into a bucket of water, and that might slow it down a little bit. But you're still going to wither. You know, I don't, I don't speak in terms of uh, I'm telling you what to do or being some Lord or anything else. I speak according to the principles and the necessity of things. I, I often revert back to looking at the necessity of things. Okay, and a lot of the time when we're talking about sin and flesh and the devil and iniquity uh, and reproving things, reproving conduct and reproving... Uh, lifestyle or whatever it's not not so much if if your motives are right it's not so much telling people what to do it's just that these are the necessities if you do this this is going to happen and i can't help that those are the spiritual laws if you separate yourself you're going to wither yeah, but I don't trust so and so and so. And uh, oh, we've heard, uh, we heard, uh, we're just, uh, you know, we, we're subject to so much, and we just don't want to be subject to the preaching anymore. And whatever, whatever your your cause is, oh, well, that's fine and dandy. You may ha- be wounded by, and you may be offended, but the reality is still, if you are separated, you will wither. It's just a reality, right? It's just a unchangeable law. But anyway. Given that we are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin and many of us have our walls of protection and we all do it to a certain degree, the devil and God are both, they're both, you know, the devil tries to copy God. We talk about that a lot. You know, the pattern of things is the same. God foreshadows what he's going to do through prophesying. We are talking the other day how Hollywood, to a large extent, is used by Satan and the uh, New World Order people and they'll make... Uh, TV series and movies to kind of foreshadow what they're doing. Because that's what God does. He foreshadows it and then He brings it to pass and He proves He's God. He foretold it. And the devil does the same thing. Well, there was some ad for Netflix in USA Today and uh, for a Netflix uh, series about cloning humans with various animals, monkeys, porcupines, pigs, and everything else. But the ad was very clever and deceitful. They didn't, they didn't, it was a four page ad, four full pages of a newspaper, but it did not say it was an advertisement until you went to the very last page at the very bottom and you saw that this was an advertisement for a Netflix um, dr- dramatic TV series, mm. fictional, so called fictional. But yet they portrayed it like reality for three pages to make it a dramatic thing. But anyway, what I'm saying is what you're seeing there is there's a lot of subtlety at work. A lot of subtlety. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So, you don't think God isn't going to use subtlety to try to win us back to the truth? Quite often God has to use subtlety because of the hardness of our hearts. As we said before, my spirit will not always strive with man. Yeah, we can go head to head and we can butt heads. And there's a time and place to butt heads. There's a time and place to be blunt, forthright, crude, and just state that this is wickedness. I'm not disannulling that, but um, as we deal among ourselves, let's say, primarily, and as God wins us, there is a subtlety and a practice of subtlety that almost becomes a necessity because we're so hardened in our hearts. People drive back and kick back at things 
Uh, there's a time and place for it, though. Yeah, if you're in danger, if you're, uh, if there's something that's like a spreading plague, well then, yes, you'll have to confront. So I'm, I'm talking about the idea of setting foreheads and, uh, well, not setting foreheads, but confrontation and that sort of thing amongst ourselves. Like I say, when, when necessity dictates, there will be confrontation. There will be contention. You can't avoid it. Earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Right? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but reprove them, expose them, call them out. If you're calling out evil and that sort of thing, that's one thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to start saying this in reference to how we deal with ourselves as, as brethren on the inside, let's say. Think of it more like that for now, anyway. So, Matthew chapter 10, he calls his 12 disciples and he gives them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. And he names the apostles. Then he tells them and commands them, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying... The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither sho shoes, nor staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into, and, and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into the house, salute it. If the house be worthy, let your peace come upon you. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. Now here we have a principle. I'm going to add something in here. A principle that I apply very much so as I meet uh, other people who say, say that, think that they're Christians and what have you. As you encounter this. Now, you uh, enter the house or enter the city. When you come to the house, salute it. Well, let's spiritualize it. You're the house, right? We're the temple. We're the house of God. People says they're, people say they're a Christian. They're a house. They're part of the house of God. Well, salute it. Praise the Lord. God bless you. How are you today? Salute the house. Well, they may not believe like we do yet, or you don't know exactly what they believe are Christians. Not they're not coming to our meetings, but maybe you meet them for whatever. It, salute the house. If the house be worthy, well, you find out. You start interacting. You start having words, right? And words are spirit. And then you have a certain Ability of discernment, as much as you know the Word of God. You know, they that are of age have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. If you have that uh, maturity, stature, to the degree that you do, you can start to discern what's happening. And, and if the house is worthy, you know, they have a good spirit. There's no guile in them. There's no deceit. There's no... Uh, a uh, very dramatic or pronounced religious spirit on them or anything like that. If the house is worthy, let your peace be upon it. And if not, let your peace return to you. In other words, you're not going to be as open to that person. You know, like say you salute a house and uh, they say, Oh, brother, I can't wait until uh, uh, we get caught up in the rapture before the tribulation comes. Well... If, if I was conversing with someone who said they were a Christian and they didn't know him that well, and they, they make, make a statement like that, well, I know we're going through the tribulation. So what would happen? My peace would re return unto me. Okay, i got to get a little more guarded here. He doesn't believe like I do. And then I have to feel things out. But this is how we approach things. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when you depart out of that, depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Well, you know how easy it is to be harmful? Especially when the chips are already on the shoulders. The hearts are already hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Of offenses and apostasy and and wickedness uh, from the heathen to the church and, and on up and everywhere else. Extortion, idolatry, sex scandals, uh, emulation, idolatry, covetousness. covetousness. All throughout Christianity, 
I mean, Christianity, we're, we're bearing the reproach of everything that's bad in Christianity. It's going to, the reproach of it's going to come on us because we identify as Christians. Even if we don't do the same things they do. They're going to lump us together. There's a stigma on us. Christian, oh, Christians, oh, you're the guys who steal all the widow's money and, 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 and sleep, and, yeah, and, and then make a long prayer and, and sleep with whores and tell everybody else not to. Well, that's what the people, a lot of people think. Because there's a lot of that. So there's a stigma. There's a reproach we're going to bear. Beware of men. They'll deliver you up to the council. They'll scourge you in their synagogues. You should be brought before governors, kings, for my sake, for testimony against them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, take no thought how, you, how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given to you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, and he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It's enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord, or like his Lord, similar, but not above. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Right? They said to Jesus, he has a devil. And what kind of manifestation in his flesh did he do that was wrong? Not a single thing. He who knew no sin, he didn't sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. No deceit, nothing. Just one about doing good, healing all that were oppressed and, heal and vexed to the devil. And for that, they said, you have a devil. Now, here we are in our sinful flesh, manifesting various sins and infirmities and inconsistencies, if you will. How much more occasion are they going to say, we, we are devils or we are reproachful? Now, anyway, fear them not. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and, that, and hid that shall not be known. Have we lived through some of this stuff? Persecuted in one city, flee to another, all that kind of stuff. Uh, being called devils, being cast out, our, our names being cast out as evil, even by brethren, kinfolk, friends, and it's going to get worse. But anyway, what I'm going to talk about here is, uh, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And this, this admonition comes as he tells his disciples who were given power don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this admonition is telling us how we should approach one another who are part of the tribe of Israel, the Israel of God. Why is the serpent harmless as doves? Now the serpent was more subtle. We're talking about subtlety, craftiness, something that's not overt. Okay, and I'm so I'm just going to take a few minutes and define the terms and reveal what this means in terms of our conduct, our, our strategy, and our approach towards one another. Like, we're supposed to have salt amongst ourselves. Like, we're not supposed to bash each other and trash each other and, and condemn each other. I understand that. But let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. Salt preserves Salt can sting a little bit, right? If it's in a wound. You know, if, if someone is wounded and you say something in reproof and it kind of touches their issue and they get a little agitated because it's reproving something they think is right, it's, it, it's going to sting a little bit sometimes. But we have to have salt amongst ourselves so we preserve ourselves. And... Uh, so let your speech be with grace, but you have to have grace. You speak the truth in love. You, 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 you establish the proper motives for speaking and sharing and reproving and admi admonishing and, 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 and trading back and forth knowledge and understanding. And, and as we do that, God gives an increase. Well, wise as serpents. So, wise, phronomos, sagacious or discreet. And implying a very cautious character. So you're going to be wise. You're going to be discreet. In other words, and you're going to be cautious. And you're going to take things into judgment. I'm going to be very cautious how I, I try this. You know, I might, 
uh, I might want a brother to uh, the bro- a brother might have some counsel, and I would like that brother to come among the saints, and I, I want to hear what he has to say. Now, the brother may have a chip on his shoulder, he may be wounded, and I might be very cautious, and I might say, gee, brother, I hear that you're investigating a certain part of the end times, or this, or that, the other thing. Why don't you come over to the fellowship and, uh, and, and preach to it? Now, the brother may have a chip on his shoulder, and he may think that he's, someone's trying to tell him what to do. And he might, uh, he might push back and say, well, you, why don't you preach? Don't tell me what to do. You, you do it. You preach. Well... That was not my motive for asking him. I was genuinely interested, hoping that he would come to fellowship and everything. But he took it the wrong way, okay? So I, what am I doing? I'm, I'm trying to be discreet. I'm trying to be careful. And I'm easing into the issue. And I get the big kickback. And the big, uh, you, know, you know, swing against me. So then, I'll back, better back off then. There's something volatile in the heart there. Remember I said before, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with men. You think God isn't getting a little worried that every time He tries to subtly suggest to us what what we're doing isn't right and try to steer us back and all He gets is the revolt and the kickback (laughs) and the butt in the head? You don't think God gets tired of that? You don't think that doesn't produce a wound in the heart of God Himself? And yet, there's only so much we can bear when we're wounded. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. Like, we have infirmities in our flesh. We get tired. We get sick. We get old and our stuff doesn't work. Our bodies don't work anymore. Our muscles don't do what they used to. We can't do what we used to do. We have infirmities. And the spirit will sustain our infirmities. If we have a strong spirit, if we're sound and whole in our hearts and we don't have a lot of wounds and hang-ups and personal offenses, and our spirit will be strong. It will help us through the physical infirmities. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? Because if your spirit is wounded, as soon as someone offends you, Boom! You, you, well, I like it. And I'm not saying this in reference against anybody. I say this as I observe my own reactions, as I overreact to things sometimes. I'll, I'll come out of my state of overreacting and I'll lament about my own state. And that sometimes I just say, well, God, maybe the best thing to do is I feel like a rabid animal. Just put me out of my misery. Just kill me and put me out of my misery. You know, sometimes people are like rabid animals. You know what a rabid animal is like. You, you could have all kinds of care and concern for the animal. Try to help it. The rabid animal is crazy. He's wounded. Just touch him and he's going to lash out and bite you. And if you're not careful, he'll pass the rabies on to you. Yeah, beware lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and it defiles many. If I'm bitter... And I mistake your concern as, as, as you, you're trying to tell me what to do and I take offense at it. My bitterness strikes back at you. What do I do? I issue a wound against you. Now when you're wounded, you, you, you get bitter. Well, why did you do that? Right? Or you have the potential to get bitter. Then maybe you'll get the bitterness. Well, bitterness is like a, a, a plague that spreads. And in the occult world, and the world of horror movies and everything else, remember all that imagery and all those patterns and imagery is, is, a, is, a, is it reveals what goes on in the spirit. Remember the va- vampire? The vampire sucks, sucks your blood, sucks the life out of you. And once the vampire bites you, bitter, bite, bite, take heed lest you bite and devour, lest you be bitter against one another. And when the vampire bites, after he bites you, what happens? You become a vampire. You see? It spreads, just spreads. Plague of bitterness. So, how do we dramatically, emphatically, with all fear and intensity, and as flames of fire, call out evil and you know, reprove evil? Well, you have to do all that. But you also have to remember, too, that where possible, we don't want that to cultivate or generate bitterness where possible. Sometimes it's just you just got to do what you got to do, though. But be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You might be even cautious with how you deal with a brother or a sister. But if your spirit is wounded, now when the spirit is wounded, the spirit is wounded, it's like nothing can appease that wounded spirit. Nothing can appease it. 
If someone does something against me and my spirit is already wounded, I may strike back at them and I'll go on 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 and on and on and on because I'm my wounded spirit is trying to seek an appeasement and I can't find it. And in my desperation, I just go overboard on the on the person. So that, that'll happen when your spirit is wounded. So wound, wounded spirit, who can bear? Because if I've got a wounded spirit and you, 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 you bring some little offense against me and it sets me off, bang, I'm going to unload everything on you. And I'm going to try to do it until I feel appeased, but my spirit's wounded. And then I can't get appeasement until God, God gives me peace in my own heart. So this I say, then, if you, if you have something to say, you want to uh, challenge your brother or confront him or say something, something happened, point out some offense he said against you, indict what you're going to say, figure out how you want to say it, and then say it as briefly as possible, and then leave it. Don't go on and 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 on. You can't, people can't bear that. He spoke the word to them as they were able to bear it. Abraham, I think it was, was it Abraham. Anyway, they're talking about how we don't want to, Esau, was it? They didn't want to overdrive their flocks in one day. There's so much we can bear. Even God. Do you think if God unleashed the fullness of everything that, it, that, that he considers is displeasing about us to him? Do you think if he just unleashed it all, all, all on once, all at once on us, and just went on and on and on and never stopped and just leveled his furious rebuke against us or his reproof, well, we couldn't take it. And that's the necessity of long suffering. So long suffering will forbear, hold back the fullness of the expression of how I'm displeased against you. Now, if I'm displeased against you, this, uh, I should just state it briefly, succinctly, clearly say it to get it out on the table. Don't go on and on and on and on. It's called overbearing. Then you become overbearing. So we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we don't want to do harm with excess. Anything like that in excess is going to do harm, even if your perception is true and right. Depends what the other person is able to bear. So, be as wise as a serpent. Cautious, discreet, subtle. It indicates using some intelligence, some perception, some wisdom that you have acquired. That's wisdom. Be as wise as a serpent. Wisdom is the principal thing, right? Wisdom. You know, what's the characteristic about a wise man? Job says that even a fool, if he holds his peace is considered wise. So, so what's this aspect or characteristic of wisdom that he's talking about? It's, it's forbearance, long-suffering, not quick, discreet, subtle, waiting, cautious, not jumping right into it. That's wisdom. Not impulsive, often, you know, every little thing, poof, sets you off. That's not wisdom. So that's what we're supposed to be. Wise as serpents. We're not supposed to be serpents. Now serpents bite. He doesn't see doesn't say bite and devour like serpents. He says be wise like serpents. Right? You watch the serpents. Watch the uh, the reptilian uh, life forms and stuff. They're very subtle. The old snake is slinking through the grass ever so slowly. Doesn't want to be detected. Well, just like that's how God is. God is looking at our walls of uh, division and our walls of protection, our, our walls of separation, and He just can't come barging in because we'll react. So He ever so subtly is looking for a way in. He's cautiously looking around, searching through. The spirit of the man, the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord. Your spirit is like the Lord's candle and, and He searches all the inward parts of the belly. So your spirit is like a candle and God's spirit is with your spirit and when they become one, God's spirit joins with your spirit and your spirit is like a candle that shows all the inward parts of what's going on in your heart. 
So God is looking down there and seeing all the little hang-ups and the false counsels and the things that you use to justify protecting yourself and seeking your own and whatever is an error. He's, he's, he's cautiously and carefully and discreetly looking at it all and devising ways by which he can bring you out of that. But you know, it took us a long time to get into this mess. And when they couldn't cast out the devil, and they said, how long has it been? Has he been like this? And they said, well, of a child. They've been like that since a child. And our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what we're dealing with. And that's where I'm going to go with this after this. Strongholds, strongholds, very strong, very complex, rooted, intertwined councils and, and networks of tangled up bondage that got roots all over our hearts. It's, it's, it's not a just, oh, just say the word of God and do it. It's just not say, utter a, utter a statement and, 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 and you're all fixed. Now, there are, God can do things like that. God can do miraculous things. But when we're talking about God operating on our hearts and healing our souls and delivering us from bondage, what He has to do is He can't, He has to first bind the strong man and spoil his goods. And, and first thing God has to do before He delivers you from an unclean spirit is He has to deal with all the intertwined roots and counsels and doctrines and perceptions that you have that convince you that have you in agreement with bondage. You've got to break the agreement. And that's a subtle thing. That's a deep thing. That's something that happens over a course of time, especially when we've been years and years being uh, coming to this state of things. We're talking about strongholds. And strongholds, we got into the stronghold by subtleties. Now as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, through his craftiness, you don't think God is craftier than the crafty devil? You know, we always said this about God. You know, the devil brings you into bondage through bitterness. God's going to set you free, free through a bitter cup. The devil brings you in bondage through ungodly fear. Those who through fear of death for all their lifetime subject to bondage through fear of death. Fear. Fear is what holds you in torment and bondage. Well, it's the fear of the Lord that's going to set you free from that. It's a different kind of fear. The devil got you in the bondage through counsel and God's going to get you out by counsel. He's, he's got the keys. Remember, what are the keys? What well, are you lawyers? You withhold the keys of? No. Knowledge. P Behold, Peter, I gave you the keys. What are the keys? The keys of the counsels, the doctrines, the knowledge, the knowledge that turns you to God and turns you away from evil and keeps you on your course and, and, and steadfastly remaining in the church, in the operation of God, seeking God, fearing God, Working out your salvation. When Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth and he went down to hell, what did he come back with? I have the keys. Yeah. I've got the keys. I know everything about how the devil got you into bondage. I know everything about how the devil works, how, how he ticks in your heart, how he deceives you, why you do the things that you that you shouldn't do, that you don't want to do, the evil you don't want to do, that you do it anyway? Why is that? What is this mystery of iniquities? I got the keys. I know why. Jesus, I know why. I, I went down to... How did Jesus get the keys? Where did he have to go to get them? He had to go to hell. Well, if I preach, and I preach a lot on bitterness, as I said before, maybe I'm the most bitter man on the face of the earth. Well, I don't want to make that as a boast either. Maybe I'm not. But all I'm saying is the husbandman that labors must first be partaker of the fruit. Consider what, I say. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. And if I'm going to give, if I'm going to deliver you from bitterness, not me personally, but if I'm going to give you counsel on behalf of God that delivers you from bitterness, how do I know about it unless I know about it? How do I know about it unless I've been to the hell of bitterness and back? Oh, I've got the keys now. I know how Satan got me trapped in bitterness. I know what he did. He made me put hope in this life. Oh, that's how he did it. He convinced me to put way too much uh, integrity in the character of man as though man is trustworthy. And man is not trustworthy. He, he, he deceived me to commit myself to what men promised me. And I didn't realize men can't deliver what they promised, even if they want to. And so when they, 
when men disappointed me and the government disappointed me and my husband and my wife or whatever in circumstance, my boss, my children disappointed me because I expected all this stuff. Oh, that's how he got me into bitterness. He made me expect something that was unreasonable to expect considering the circumstances. Why do I get bitter against the hotel guys who don't seem to give a darn about me and, and, and if I'm not careful, they just drive me into the ground with their requests? That's not their fault. That's my fault. Why should I expect righteousness out of them? I've said this many times. Right? The ungodly, are they subject to the law of God? Can they be? Why am I expecting something from them that they cannot deliver? So then if I get bitter, it's not their fault. It's my fault. See, that's a key. That's a key. Okay, well then I I better start reflecting on myself more and not them. Yeah. Okay, I better just learn how to get more fortitude and not uh, overcome these counsels that make me think like I'm obligated to do everything they ask me to when I'm not and just refuse to do some of the things they ask me to and get strength to do that from God. See, I, there's a counsel. I, there's, there's a key. There's a key. And if I follow that key, that knowledge will eventually set me free from bitterness towards those guys. You, you see how it all works. We're talking about knowledge. We're talking about keys. And uh, if I don't get the message, well, I'll just suffer some more and suffer some more. All right? As many as have not known the depths of Satan, some people are ordained to know the depth of a certain avenue of iniquity or evil or attribute of Satan. And uh, sometimes you, they're uh, ordained to do that in order to come back with keys. That's what I'm saying. Jesus had to go to hell to get the keys. Well, I've been to the hells of bitterness and back, and I'm still making my way back in some some respects, but I've got some keys with me. I didn't come back empty-handed. So, discreet, cautious, subtle, wise as a serpent, wise as a serpent. Now, a serpent, let's look at the serpent. As we said, the serpent was sly and cunning. Let me go back to this. Look at the reptilian... uh, species of animals i used to be fascinated at it for this for the very reason that that i understood that the reptilian species of animals were are representative of satan and the unclean spirits you know and the amphibians to frogs out of the frogs came the unclean spirits you know satan is the serpent the snake as you go and then you got lizards and all that sort of thing what did I notice? They're very subtle. I'd go into the pet store and I'd see some iguana in an aquarium. And uh, as I'd walk back, the iguana would kind of... And then he, his eyes would shift over to the side. And he wouldn't look right at me. But I knew he was watching me. But he didn't want me to know he was watching me. So he wouldn't look straight at me. He wouldn't confront me directly. He would just move his eyes off to the side. And pretend he's looking off to the side, but he's actually taking note of me. Well, that's subtlety. That's craft. That's sly. That's cunning. That lets, uh, almost working in secret sort of thing. Subtlety. Now, the, the serpent, the other thing about snakes is they have very, very sharp vision. So if you're skillful in the use of the word and you're skillful as a peacemaker skillful as you function in the body of Christ, you have very sharp vision. You see very, very detailed, acutely what's really going on. So when I talk about vision, every once in a while, I've preached over the years, that uh, Christians need to have uh, stereo vision. You have a left eye and you have a right eye. And if you cover your left eye and only use your right, or vice versa, cover your right eye and only use your left, you can still see things, but what you, lo- you, what you lose is the perception of depth. You cannot tell depth when you cover one eye or the other. Right. And we know what the Bible talks about the left and the right. The left is like the law, the left hand. And the right is like mercy and grace and forgiveness and fellowship and forgiveness of God and everything else. So you have a left eye, which is like law, legalism. Doesn't doesn't include mercy. It's just, you know... A, letter of the law and it kills and it just it doesn't offer hope or mercy or grace it doesn't consider the extenuating circumstances the state of the individual it doesn't take anything into account 
It's just cut and dried. Let law. And then the right, of course, is grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, you know, if you only have a left eye, then all you see is legalism. Legalism. One wrong move, kill it. You know, one wrong move, level the penalty on them. Right away. No, don't hear any case. Don't hear any extenuating circumstances. I don't care what state he was in. There is no mercy in, in law, right? It kills. But then uh, if all you have is a right eye, all you have is grace, then you become too slack. You see, then you become too free to perform evil. Because it's all, it's all grace. God doesn't care what we do. Grace will always cover me. No, sometimes your own discretion, as I was saying before, sometimes your own discretion is supposed to cover you and preserve you. And uh, as I said before, we're not the people who have transgressed too far on the left as a general thing. I mean, this is not an absolute statement, but if you look at the world as a whole, our generation, the church, where we are, where has holiness gone? Where is the standard? Where, where is the holiness? Where is the purity? It's gone. It's gone. Why? Because we erred too much on the right. Our perception of grace became as though we think God is slack. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care about that stuff. Because we're too much grace, not enough law. Just remember, God, Jesus never did away with the law. He's making out of the two one new man. We have to know about law and we have to know about grace. That's the, you know, as you read the letter of the law and you begin to be able to get confident that you can identify, okay, the scripture says that, so that's wrong. He's doing that and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. Well, that's one thing, right? I mean, defile not the temple of the, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, defile not the temple. So I go downtown and I see some heathen smoking a cigarette and I say, he's wrong, he's defiling the temple. But wait a sec, is he a Christian? Has he ever had the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ? You know, has he ever had the opportunity to experience the power of God to deliver him from his vice? Where, where is like, what's going on here? What's, what's the whole status of this man? Right, the letter of the law. Well, okay. The other thing you should say is, well, okay. Well, he is not in the church. Okay, God judges him. I don't judge him. Go ahead, smoke. It's just like homosexuality. We know homosexuality is, is perverse and contrary to nature, contrary to God. We know that. No homosexual enters the kingdom of God, neither does any covetous man, or idolater, or drunkard. So are you in the church? If any man, I wrote to you an epistle not to company with fornicators, not altogether with fornicators of this world, but if any man be called a brother and a fornicator, don't company with them. The fornicators of the world, they're, they're outside. God judges them. So if you're a homosexual and you're an atheist, I'm still going to preach against homosexuality in general. But personally, between me and some individual who's a homosexual and an atheist, go ahead, be a homosexual. I'm not going to stop you. I might tell you, it's, I might warn you, it's warm. I might say it once or twice or if I have opportunity. But I don't have no, any power of enforcement to them that are without. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's my context here tonight. Why is the serpents harmless as doves? I'm not as concerned about hurting the feelings of somebody out there as I am about offending somebody in the church. As a matter of principle. Uh, why is the serpents? Serpents have a sharpness of vision. Your sharpness of vision is when you understand both law and grace. And you can see the depth of a spiritual work God is doing. We know that as men we have to fumble and stumble and struggle with the power of sin and learn this lesson that I can't do it myself and it creates a cry in our heart to cry unto God for deliverance. We know the just man falls seven times. The wicked will fall into mischief. And how often shall my brother uh, sin and I forgive him? Seven times in a day? Jesus says 70 times seven. Well, spiritualize it. What day is he talking about? Let's call the day the day of salvation. The working out of your salvation. The perfecting of your soul. And that day uh, uh, of our lifetime in this earth is our day of perfection. Right? And there's seven major attributes of sin that we're going to be cleansed and purged from. Right, six things that the Lord hates, seven are an abomination unto Him. You know, envy, lust, sloth, whatever, the Catholic seven deadly sins. Seven major attributes of sin. And in each area that God purges us, we may fall, in each of those seven cleansing processes, we may fall multiple times learning how to overcome that sin. All right, and that's just the reality of things. As I said before, our, our dividing line the, uh, the, the caution there is that 
um, there's a certain amount of sin that God will allow for us to learn these lessons, then there's the excess, the superfluity of sin, where you sin way above and beyond, you sin provisionally, deliberately, all that kind of thing. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the lust of the flesh to fulfill it. You don't make plans, deliberate attempts, and continuous uh, efforts to strive towards your sins so that you can sin. You strive against sin, and then when you fall, there's the grace that gives you provision. That, that's how it works. Amen. Otherwise, you're actually transgressing grace. Right. All right. So we're not saying do evil. let us do evil that good may come. We're saying that if you do excess of evil and it's too deliberate, then you're, you're not transgressing physically, you're transgressing grace. You've entered into a spiritual transgression. <clears throat> Sharpness of vision. How sharp is your vision? How, how much do you consider the depth of things of what God is doing? <clears throat> okay. Snake, serpent, artful, an artful, cunning, sly creature. And we're supposed to be like that towards each other in bringing up and in, in contributing to our perfection, encouraging and admonishing and warning one another. All right, so why is a serpent harmless as does? Harmless. Well, that just means being innocent of, of malice and not causing injury. As we said, there's going to be some times when the sword will injure or the sword will, will bring pain. But we don't want to harm the operation of God. We don't want to hinder it. As we heard before, don't minister to re rebellion. Don't deliberately do the things that you know will provoke needlessly the negative response and cause offense. As harmless as a dove. Dove, any, ver any of various widely distributed birds of the family Columba Day, which includes the pigeons having a small head, characteristic cooing call, a gentle, innocent person, a person who advocates peace, conciliation or reconciliation, and they advocate negotiation in preference to confrontation and arms conflict. Now, look, if, if I'm with some false prophet who is is just defiling the whole concept of, of grace and we're having it out and I'm earnestly contending for the truth. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have any qualms about getting into an armed conflict. Carpet bomb, right. Carpet bomb and swing and swipe and punch. and yeah. Hey, that's not the truth. And of course, I have to be right of it. Not because I hate him. Because, yeah. hey, this is... this this. This council is going to defile, can defile the whole body of Christ. We're already too far to the right, brothers. We, we, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right eye offends you, if your right hand, if the way you act on grace offends you, causes you to do too much evil, it's, it's the offense of grace. It's the misperception of grace that's going to turn you away and make you sin too much. Not your misperception of law. That's not our problem in this generation. It's our right eye that's offending us. It's the way we perceive grace. That's what's offending us. And if that's the case, we've got to go back to law a bit, don't we? Law always should support the fear of God. And the, the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. The law isn't for a righteous man. If you're walking in the righteousness of Christ, uh, you're not under the law. The law is not for you. Who is the law for? Yeah, we know the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Not one jot or tittle is going to pass from the law. The only thing that we're, we're not subject to is the handwriting of Moses' ordinances. That got nailed to the cross. Remember, we went through all this. Moses made a handwriting of ordinances, but what's on the tables of stone are the Ten Commandments Bible is explicitly clear that the Ten Commandments were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God. The work was the work of God. Written with the finger of God. Not a hand. Not handwriting. A finger of God. The finger of God is the Holy Ghost. If I by the finger of God cast out devils. If I by the power of the Holy Ghost cast out devils. The handwriting of ordinances is Moses' work. Moses wrote it. The tables of stone, God wrote it. Two distinctively different concepts, principles, descriptions, 
You have to think of them as separate. People still don't get that. They think that the handwriting of ordinances nailed to the cross was the Ten Commandments. It was not. The Ten Commandments is still standing. That law, that's the law Jesus said. Not one jot or tittle will pass away till all be fulfilled. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Which ones? Oh, pay your tithes, obey the feast days, uh, get circumcised. No, no, no. Those are handwriting of ordinances nailed to the cross. Here are the ones you, you obey to inherit eternal life. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Honor your father and mother. Don't bear false witness. Jesus telling you what you have to do to be saved. You've got to keep those things. Not only do you have to keep them, you've got to take heed how you're keeping them. They can't just be kept because your will decided to keep them. You're keeping them because you've learned how to die out to yourself and now the divine nature is operating in your bodies. As I said before, I'll say it again. If the divine nature is operating in you, it's the Holy Ghost, the nature of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus' character was when he was on the face of the earth. Did he lie? Did he cheat? Did he commit adultery? Did he bear false witness? No, he kept them all and told us that's what we have to do. Yes, us in the New Testament, keep those commandments. Plus, 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 give up all you have. Then you have treasure in heaven. Follow me, pick up your cross. Like they say, people think grace is slacker than the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament law, they had their Old Testament law to adhere to. And now, the, Jesus comes on along and says, yeah, yeah, you've got to keep those Ten Commandments now in the age of grace. But not only that, plus, there's, there's even more required of us in grace. God gave us more, requires more of us. We've got to produce the righteousness of Christ in our flesh. Now, where am I going? So, this is the law. Who? Well, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of mothers and murderers of fathers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. And the sound doctrine advocates and promotes and produces holiness and purity. So you're a Christian and you're a, a man stealer. You're a Christian and you're covetous. You're a Christian and you're a whoremonger. Guess what's for you? Guess what's for you? The law. The law is there to identify and point it out and sting your conscience with it one more time. And you think it's not relevant because it's the Old Testament. The law says, you know, don't do that stuff. Well, Paul points all that out in the New Testament as well. And I'm not going to go into that. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah, the law. So you you got you to gotta have a left eye and a right eye. You have to understand law and when it's okay to use the law. That's what I mean. If I, if I preach, no covetous man enters the kingdom of God. If you do, you're going to hell. I'm not condemning you. I'm not putting you under the law. You, by committing the sin, are under the curse of the law. You sin with the law, you die and be judged according to the law. You sin without the law, you die without the law. You, you sin, you die. <laughs> Wages of sin is death. doesn't matter who you are anymore. Do, do we get this yet? Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition, makes no distinction at all between Jew or Gentile or anything else. The Gentile or the Jew, the church or the world, the law was given, the New Testament uh, identifies and characterizes the law and that the law was given that, what, the church becomes guilty before God? The law was given that the whole world becomes guilty before God. The whole world. So we got to understand law and grace. Not just law and not just grace. And as I said, just to emphasize it again, the church of our generation is not erring on the side of legalism. Now, I'm, it's not an absolute, there may be people that err on legalism. I'm saying as a general generality, on the whole, what do you see in the church? Everything's slack, nothing's pure, nothing's holy. Nothing's disciplined. Nobody's picking up the cross. 
Nobody's producing purity and holiness to the degree that it once was. It's fallen away. It's backslid. Or, re- or worse, apostatized. So that's our error, if you're right. That's why Jesus didn't say, you know, those people who lived in the Old Testament, were they all lost? Some of them had faith in Jesus Christ. So they're not all lost. But Jesus hadn't come yet. So when Jesus hadn't come, where were they kept? Under the law. Kept under the law till Christ comes. Well, I, I, I just I haven't had the opportunity to work this out with God to let the Christ come forth in my flesh. I'm working it out. I'm still fighting. I'm still struggling. So Christ has not come yet. Like I'm apply it to myself as an individual. Christ hasn't come forth yet. He hasn't come yet. So before Christ comes, what am I kept under? You better understand law and grace work simultaneously at the same time continuously in the church of the New Testament till we come to perfection. And they both have their use in their place. We just simply do not trust in the law to produce the righteousness. But when you're not producing the righteousness, the law is administered, preached, to stir up conviction, holy godly fear, to identify what's evil, to remind us, to inspire us, to uh, motivate us to strive against it. Even if you don't strive against it in perfection, at least you strive against it and you find out that this power is something more powerful than you are and it's doing a work to create a cry in your heart and I've said that many times. Either way, we're using the law. Okay, so... The thing about the snake is the snake has very, very, very sharp vision. And uh, so that's what we need to strive towards, that we understand law and we understand grace. I'm not saying use law to condemn people with, but we don't understand both. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be you wise as serpents, harmless as a dove. The dove... And I'm saying this mainly amongst brethren. I was much rather negotiate, counsel, and uh, try to speak the truth in love as a dove. Blessed are the peacemakers. I would prefer that first rather than to just come out, slash bang, butt heads, have a big confrontation with brothers that I've known for five, ten years, what have you. And I'm trying to also make the distinction that there are other contexts out there where you are contending. There's, there's no problem getting confrontational. But one thing I won't, do not want to do is debate the truth. I don't want to debate the truth. I was watching YouTube and watching certain ministers uh, making their stand on doctrinal things that I, I don't believe and that I know for a fact aren't scriptural. And... Um, <clears throat> And they were so. Oh, I challenge you to a debate. And so they had this debate with rules. Okay, you have five minutes to now describe, introduce yourself and your credentials. Okay, now you can take five minutes and you know magnify your credentials. Okay, now here's the first point that we will debate and back and forth. No, I don't. I don't advocate anything like that at all. Anything like that at all. So you can contend for the truth when it's challenged, especially when a uh, council is going to infiltrate and damage the standards of the church or has the potential to produce unrighteousness, uh, moving away from holiness and purity, you can contend for it. You can get vigilant. You can get militant. You can get... Right? But amongst ourselves here, let's be wise. Let's... And if we're peacemakers amongst ourselves, we we prefer... It's, it's, it's the whole... You know, uh, mercy will rejoice against the judgment. I'd rather see peaceable. The fruits of righteousness are sown in peace. 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 Yeah. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Perfect man. Doesn't mean that there'll never be offense. We understand that. But it's like, are we trying this first? <laughs> are we trying to be peaceable first? Or are we flying off the handle right off, right off the bat? And if we are, maybe it's because we're, wo- we're wounded. 
So we have to bear one another's burdens and we have to keep ourselves in check and try not to be um, injurious. That's Paul said. Neither was I injurious, but I was gentle among you as a nurse cherishes her children, Paul said. And he was saying that as he was ministering to God's flock, them that are within. Do you think he was gentle like a little children contending with the scribes and the Pharisees? No, he was very, uh, if he, yeah, he was very bold, very authoritative, stood his ground. And that will bring me into uh, fasting, because I talked about strongholds, okay? And I know I said this before, but I was talking to a few people about it through the week, and it got me thinking about it, so I'll, I'll just review it a little bit. Okay, so we have certain things coming into effect here. Um, this is, I know this as a matter of principle, and um, you know, I haven't gone on any big marathon fasts or anything, but I'm more conscious of it, and I've gone on a number of smaller ones. But um, then came the disciples of John saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? Jesus said, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. So I said this in reference both to Brother Stair and also in reference to Brother Glenn in Pembroke, who was an evangelist that I was under. And both these men died. And both of these men had positions where they were chief chief individual men of authority over, over a, a congregation of God's people. And I talked about Son of Man, how I, I just don't believe uh, that any singular man in the New Testament carries that title. I did, I did uh, defend the idea of similitudes, that men of God have similar... They are set up to be similar, have similar demonstrations of, you know, similitudes, not exactitudes, uh, not a prototype of Jesus Christ, which means an exact copy, but a similitude. But it's got to be similitude because they have their own infirmities and everything else. But as such, uh, they function as the bridegroom. And I'm not saying that Glenn or Brother Stair are Jesus Christ. Neither of them really believe that they ever were. Uh, but what I'm saying is as similitudes and as patterns, I'm trying to point out, when, when the disciples had a single man of God that was sent to them and they looked to that man of God, that was Jesus Christ in the flesh. right? And they looked to him and he gave them the counsel, everything spiritual that they needed. He was right there in the flesh with them to deliver all their spiritual needs. And then what happened? Well, he was taken away. The flesh body they crucified him. He ascended up into heaven. Now they have no more man sitting right in front of them. They can ask questions and, and watch his patterns and examples. He's gone. And that's what Jesus is saying. As long as I'm with them, they don't need to fast. I'm right, I'm right here. But the days are coming where I'm going to be taken away. In those days, they'll fast. So here's one criteria to know when to fast. Well, if you had been receiving uh, all your spiritual sustenance and counsel from the flesh, from a man of God, or even from the brotherhood, let's say, and you're used to getting everything you need from fleshly vessels, let's say you're, you're on the breast, so to speak, because that's how the baby is drawn to the mother's breast, right? Gets its nourishment by physical contact with the mother. We get our spiritual nourishment by physical contact with each other in the flesh. Well then, what happens when that fails? What happens if that fails? What happens if your man of God is taken away? And he was set up as the guy to look to for all this stuff. And What happens? You better start fasting, finding out direction from God. You need to fast. Your bridegroom's taken away. Do we understand that? That pattern has come upon a lot of us. Okay. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Fasting is not a physical human discipline. The times to fast are not regulated, delegated, uh, scheduled, and consistent Every Tuesday and Thursday, I'll fast. Now, 
if, if you do something like that, I'm not going to discredit it entirely, but I'm just going to say that, you know, we, we can't, uh, as soon as you start getting too deliberately structured and everything else, that's not really what perfection is. Perfection is, I will fast when the Spirit tells me there's a need to fast. And when you need to fast is one, when the bridegroom is taken away. Two, when you were on the breast or you had uh, a lot of support and, and, and uh, edification from the rest of the body of Christ in the flesh and all of a sudden no one seems to have a word, kind word for you anymore. No one seems to know, tell you anything that can help you out anymore. They don't know. They don't care. Whatever the case is. And you're kind of left stranded all alone. Well, how do I know then? How do I get encouragement? How do I get... Uh, Counsel, how do I get insight on what to do? Well, you better fast. To whom shall he make to know knowledge? To whom shall he make to know these things? Them that are drawn from the breast. Your reliance on flesh becomes less and less. And now God is drawing you into the seek God personally. And in those days you, you fast. And again... Fasting is identified with mourning. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Fast, that's why I say fasting is not so much a discipline. Fasting is a state of being afflicted and mourning over things. So it's not a schedule thing. It's whenever you're afflicted, whenever you're mourning over your state or the state of the church, or, or grieved over someone who's stuck in a stronghold and they can't seem to get out. You know they want to, but they can't. How come we couldn't cast them out? Well, because of your unbelief. I say, whose unbelief? Was it Jesus' unbelief? Of course not. Yeah. Was it the devil's unbelief that they couldn't cast them out? No, the devil believes and trembles. Whose unbelief? He said, because of your unbelief, not individual, because the church just doesn't have enough cultivated faith, spirit of faith and spirit of power. He said, however, however, this kind, this stronghold stuff, it's not going to come out except by prayer and fasting. And I've preached this and I've heard the kickback personally and I, I now I even hear the kickback in my imagination so I'm going to address the issue. I'm not saying anyone's kicking back but you've got to address it. Oh, uh, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Oh, we heard that last year. We heard it the year before and then nothing happened. We prayed and fasted and nothing happened. Well, I personally reject all those counsels and I prefer to embrace the Word of God. I don't care if nothing happened. It's the truth is the truth. It's the truth. You'll see, I'll explain fasting here. You'll know how to fast. You'll know when to fast. When do you fast? The bridegroom's taken away. Your chief man of God isn't around anymore, whoever he is. He's not around anymore. Okay, I look to the brothers and that might work for a while. Now even the brothers don't seem to have what I really need to keep me in peace and and uh, good standing and good conscience towards God. You're being drawn from the breast. God's trying to deal with you now personally, draw you into a personal exercise of seeking Him. And then you're afflicted. You're mourning. So you're not like the Pharisee. I always like to say how the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God. And he addresses God, but who is he with? He's praying with himself. God isn't even present. Not even there. I fast. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. See? Well, it's not like that. I mean, and even with the tithes, and I don't want to get too much into tithes, but, you know, the essence of the Spirit is be moved by the Spirit. When, as soon as you put something on a schedule, the Spirit cannot move you according to a specific, unique, individual circumstance or need. Because specific, unique, individual circumstances and deeds arise not on a schedule. You know, I scheduled to speak certain things today. I studied certain things. I said a lot of things that I did not schedule to say. Because I just can't operate like that. I can't operate in that rigid, scheduled, uh, predefined way that I think I'm going to plan every word and say everything this way. You can't because you don't know how the Spirit's moving. It's wind blows where it listens. You don't know where it's coming. You don't know where it's going. I don't know what I'm going to say half the time. I mean, I'll still prepare because I think it's, it, 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 I think my preparation to, uh, to look at a doctrine and assemble scriptures is part of my um, expression to God that I take this seriously. Amen. I think He'll honor that, but I may not say what I studied. 
Right? Okay. Can't put God in a box. All right, so we know the publican couldn't lift up his eyes to heaven and be merciful to me, a sinner, who went down justified the publican. The man with what? Humility. The one who thought highly of himself or the one who thought nothing of himself. We're not doing this without humility. I spent a month, a whole month, week after week after week in Pembroke, pressing, pressing, humility, 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 humility. Right? The two people with great faith. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Oh, well, I'm not, right. just speak the word only and my servant will be, will be here. I have not found so great faith. What does this great faith start off with? Humility. I'm not worthy. I'm nothing. Yeah. You think faith is going to work properly without humility? Yeah. Or without, you think love is not going to work properly without humility? You think you're going to submit without humility? I submit because I know I'm lower than the power that I'm submitting to. Because I know it. That's humility. Absolutely. You have humility, game over. I don't care what faith you have. I don't care what your sacrifice is. You don't have humi- I don't care if you can move mountains. I don't care if you say you love the Lord all day long. You don't have no humility. You're nothing. It's game over. Nothing. You're not fulfilling the Word of God in any way, shape, or form. It starts with humility. Why did I say that? Because I watch these guys in Pembroke constantly drawing attention to what God is doing and making the boast. And so I kept preaching, hitting that issue, hitting that issue. Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? These people that did these great works for God, when they get to judgment, they didn't even know what they were doing. They didn't even have an opportunity to draw attention to what they were doing in, in the Lord. Right? So what it means is the great work that was being done was being done just naturally by a a divine nature flowing through them and it had no deliberation, no conscious awareness. Nothing like, I am going to give so much money over here and and they will be blessed of God by my contribution. No, these people who did these great works, they didn't even know it. And I, I started out talking about why is the serpents harmless as doves I've given you power, freely receive, freely give. You know what happens? They come back. <laughs> the devils are subject to us through thy name. Wow, look what's happening through us. Oh, we're having a great crusade. Great miracles are taking place. Really? And you're keeping a scorecard of all the great things God's doing through you? And you're holding a consciousness of it? And you're cultivating that? Satan fell as lightning. Here, that's the first guy who did that. First guy who did that start taking a scorecard and noting all the great work, things that are taking place through him. The first guy who did that was Lucifer. He's out. He's out. Humility doesn't draw attention to itself like that. Right? It doesn't. It just doesn't. And that's the Pharisee. Oh, I do this and I do this and I fast and I tithe. And I'm not saying you cannot be conscious of some of the things you do. Sometimes you do a work and the the Bible says that let every man prove his own work and then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So if you want to be come to a conclusion of a consciousness that you did a work that was righteous and, and pleasing to God and you want to be conscious of it for the sake of encouraging your own soul, I think that's legitimate. I think that's valid, but the Bible tells you how to approach that. Have rejoicing in yourself alone, not in another. The principle is still there. Don't deliberately draw attention to it or get caught up in the exercise of drawing attention to it. You really you've got to watch that. That was a, a side on humility. Well, when you're fasting in, in the will of God, you are afflicted. When you are afflicted, you are needy. When I need something, I am the lower, I am the lesser. Without contradiction, the less is blessed of the greater. Okay, if I'm financially poor and I need money to buy my dinner or pay my rent or whatever it is, and you have lots of money and I have nothing, right? I'm needy, I'm poor. You are the greater, I am the lesser. I am affliction puts you in the condition of humility. If you can't have if you can't find yourself in the condition of humility, affliction will put you there. And when he began to be in want, the prodigal son, when he when the big famine came, 
You know, how, how, about, how about Joseph's brethren? Weren't they not pretty uh, puffed up and haughty and, and arrogant and uh, murderous and threw Joseph into the pit? What will this dreamer, will this dreamer do? Yeah, throw him in the pit. Well, what happened when the great famine came around? Oh, now Joseph's brethren are in Egypt and Joseph is second ruler next to Pharaoh and now he's holding all the aces, cards, if you will. Not the best allegory, but you know what I mean. <laughs> he said it. I was about to say it anyway. So, yeah, he's, he's, he's got the full deck now. And uh, so he says, you know, he, he, he feigns himself. He sort of toys with them, sports with them a little bit, puts them to the test. He says, oh, you are spies. You are spies to spy out the land or you are come. And what does Joseph's brethren say after they're in their affliction and they're in famine and they're in desperate need? They say, no, my, my Lord, we be not spies, but we be true men. Our motives are pure. We're in our humility. We know that we need help. What did that? Well, that was quite a change of character for Joseph's brother, wasn't it? Brethren. That's quite a change of character. What did it? The affliction. Get ready. God is getting ready to afflict us. To save us. I'll leave in the midst of you on uh, afflicted. Uh, poor people. And who will they trust? They'll trust in the name of the Lord. Well, back to fasting. David. Prayer of the afflicted. Psalm 102. When he's overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. My days are consumed like smoke. My bones burn as a hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. When you are afflicted in mourning, when you are in grief, you are so distracted from normal life and everything else, you'll, you'll forget to sleep. You'll forget to eat. I'm just saying, as a general rule here, not eating and all of that is just a characteristic of being in affliction. And we know when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites and don't put on a sad countenance and disfigure their faces. Oh, I'm fasting so much for the Lord. Oh, I hope He sees me. Oh. You know, don't disfigure your faces that they may appear to men to fast. They have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that they'll appear not to men to fast. Again, humility. Don't do this to be seen. Don't keep a sore card. Don't be the Pharisee. Oh, I fast twice a week. Nope. Your father is which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And I'm not saying that no one can ever know what you do for the Lord. But don't you make a case of it. Let another man's lips praise thee. You have rejoicing in yourself alone and, and don't don't keep the scorecard and, and pursue the great magnification to everybody of what God is doing through you. Jesus warned them, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. And then you stay in humility. Alright, so Lord have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic, sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and oft into the water. I brought him to thy disciples. They could not cure him. Jesus says, Faithless, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Jesus rebuked the devil. He departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And came the disciples to Jesus apart. Why could we not cast him out? He said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Okay, thrown into the fire, thrown into the waters. You've got some issue of sin, some spirit keeps throwing you into the trouble, throwing you into affliction, throwing you into a mess, into the waters of affliction, into the fire of torment, whatever. And, uh, okay, I read that already. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. So, fasting is afflicting yourself. It's a deliberate afflicting of yourself. You're saying, 
the world sustaining me is not as important as God sustaining me. And as an expression of that, I will stop letting food sustain my body and I will stop and I will afflict myself and I will use that as an expression of approaching God because I'm mourning. I'm struggling. My brother's struggling. And we'll get to the scripture here very soon in Isaiah 58, which is really sort of the landmark scripture I'm going for. And I'm going to skip through some of these things. But, hey, you know, fasting is a valid thing with God when it's done right and in the right context at the right time for the right reason. Therefore, also now, Joel 2.12, turn ye even to me with all your heart with fasting, weeping, mourning. See, identified with affliction, mourning, grieving, fasting. Fasting is always mourning, always and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger and great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. And for that scripture, I just, uh, I'm not, uh, the Holy Ghost can call you to fast. You may hear a voice of the Lord saying, I want you to fast. That's, that would be Urim coming to you, the Lord telling you. But here he is saying, you, sanctify, set apart a time that you're going to fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, and so on. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Okay, not a reference to fasting per se, but... Yeah, the problem with straight discipline is the Pharisees' fast was, became a routine and waxed and became a confidence in his own discipline and the regularity of his fasts. And it became dictated by self-will. It did not acknowledge the motivation of fasting as I'm describing it here. And here we get to Isaiah 58. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Now when we approach to God, there's nothing wrong with approaching God. But we don't want to become content in that just that we practiced approaching to God. We, we have to follow through and actually follow through after we approach to God, to follow through on what God tells us to do. Right? The, the Pharisee took approach that took delight in himself of his approaching to God and didn't go any further than that. He never arrived at any affliction. He, he never arrived at any conclusive, decisive will of God that he was to do as a result of his fasting. He simply just did it, was proud of his sacrifice and thought that the discipline meant something to God. You know, it's like God says, hey, obedience is better than sacrifice. I'd rather you obey the gospel, obey the word of God, recognize when somebody needs fasting, or when, you're in, when you recognize your own affliction, your own state of mourning, and just fast because you recognize that. Not because it's Tuesday at 7 o'clock or whatever. Uh, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find... Pleasure, I fast twice in the week. And you exact all your labors. Well, you don't, you don't need to exact anything when you're fasting. Now, you may. You may say, so-and-so has this certain condition and they need help. Well, you, and if you know that, you can specify those things to God as you pr pray and fast. That's another thing. Fasting with prayer is, is the idea here, too. Um, However, you you know you can't you can't exact all your your labors. It's not something like well, okay. Every time I want something, I'll fast. And God, you do this particular thing. That's that's not the idea. Then God becomes your servant instead of you being His servant. Um, behold, you fast for strife and, and debate. Well, I saw this when um, the uh, I was in the Oneness Church, and the Oneness Church would have they would set up debates with the Trinitarians. They would actually have meetings where some Trinitarian believing Pentecostal preachers would gather with some oneness Pentecostal preachers and they would debate the oneness of God versus the Trinity of God. And they would debate it, like in a formal debate. 
And the, these guys would pray and fast for the power of God to win their debate. So that's what I mean. I'm, I'm not going to debate anything. Anyone calls me to a debate, I'll say, take a hike. I'm preaching. You listen, to, you, you, you listen to me preach. And if you have something from God and you think I need to hear it, you preach it. And I'll, I'll judge whether it's of God. You know, Spiritual man judges all things. Debate is a work of the flesh. Contending for the faith is not. But contending for the faith is not a specific, deliberate, on such and such a day at a time, we're going to debate this topic. You have ten minutes, I have ten minutes. Nothing so formal can, can, be, can be remotely conceived or perceived as being of the Spirit. It, you're putting God in a box here. All right, now I'm almost done. You fast for strife and debate. To smite with a fist of wickedness, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? So what kind of fast does God choose? Here it is. It's God defines the fast that He cho chooses. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. We're fasting to break the bondage in the church, the oppression, the burdens... Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Which is often why I'll go on a fast. I'll say, i got to deliver this bread, Lord, this counsel. I don't feel like I've studied or I don't feel worthy or I'm not sure of this and I'm not sure of that. But at least uh, eventually, as I war in my mind, I can come to the conclusion that it really doesn't have a whole lot more to do, much to do with me as it has to do with the church, right? Of people wanting to hear the Word of God. They're hungry. They... They need something to eat. Give me, give me something to eat that I can give them to eat, Lord. If I can't believe He'll do it for me, I believe He'll do it for you. Okay. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? We saw a lot of people cast out of ministries hoping that they'll be drawn to this house, right? Because we're promoting the forsaking not the assembling of ourselves and many won't, won't assemble. But... Some have, right? Some of them that are cast out have been drawn. When you see the naked, thou cover him, and hide not thyself from thine own flesh. In other words, refuse to partake of this communion, gathering together. Go separate yourself. Sensual, having not the Spirit. When does the Spirit ever tell you to separate yourself? Now, in the age that we're in, Antichrist is going to seek to scatter the power of the holy people, so he will promote the separation of people. So, so I expect to see people, a tendency towards people being motivated to separate because Satan is working, Antichrist is working diligently in that capacity. But I will never promote that counsel. I will always promote gathering. That you hide not yourself from your own flesh. If you will have the Spirit or you will have the Spirit's influence then eventually the Spirit will lead you to others. And if that's, this is the fast now, you hear what, what the fast that God chose, and if that's why you're fasting for the church, for your brother to go free, undo his heavy burden, Lord, deliver him from that bondage that throws him into the waters and into the fire, that stronghold that uh, our seemingly our, our unbelief can't, can't, can't work a deliverance for that brother or sister, bring down that stronghold, this kind comes not out by prayer and fasting. If that's why you're fasting, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thy health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. And that means God will protect you from behind. The rearward is what's behind you. In other words, all the past mistakes you made and everything in the past and everything, God will protect you from the glory of the Lord will protect you from you being knocked off of your confidence in your faith by what you did behind you. Then thou shalt call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, Here am I. Remember I was saying the other week, Neither shall thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. Thou shalt hear a word. This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand or to the left, yeah, the Lord will say, Here I am. This is the way. Go here. Go there. You'll get clearness. You'll get it. This is the fast God chose, and this is His response to the fast that He chose. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, 
Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness shall be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So think about it. Think about all the promise of what God will do to those who respond and exercise themselves into the fast that God hath chosen because they love God, because they are afflicted. They're mourning for the state of the church, the state of their own souls. Their bridegroom has been taken away. They can't get what they need from the fleshly administration of the church. All of these things. And this is the fast that God has chosen. I'm just saying we're coming into the season of, of this. So, wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and then the the um, exhortation to the righteous fast that God has chosen. So I described the characteristics of it, the motivation for fasting, what God will do when we do that, and uh, kind of pointing out that there's enough things that have happened to us recently that put us in this season. And that's it. I'm done. Praise the Lord.